गुड इवनिंग आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू मेजर जनरल नीरन कुमार फाउंडर ऑफ लेक्स कंसिलियम एंड ए लीडिंग लीगल मेमरी फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू शेयर माई अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ टीचिंग पेडोलॉजी ऑफ कंपेरेटिव पब्लिक लॉ आई शेल बी प्राइमरली डीलिंग विद कंपेरेटिव पब्लिक लॉ एंड आउटकम बेस्ड एजुकेशन विच इज़ द न्यू नॉम एंड द लीगल सिस्टम्स ऑफ इंडिया यू एस यू के एंड स्विटरलैंड प्राइमरीली एंड द primary theories which one should touch upon while dealing with this subject so as we know now uh, every institution of higher learning has to go through uh, nec accreditation and nec is emphasizing a lot on outcome based education and when we speak of outcome based education every program should have some objectives and then we have to map that whether we have uh, achieved those objectives or not so when we uh, talk of uh, this pro, uh, course on uh, comparative public law this is taught in llm uh, normally in first semester so every llm course will have its objective so we have to uh, uh, frame the objectives maybe uh, faculty can sit down together and it should be approved by the board of studies members and it goes to academic council also so we have to align this course with the program objective of this uh, llm and then this course also will have some co and pos so when i say co and pos the course also will have its objective why are we teaching this course so uh, objective is can be to familiarize the student with different theories and different legal structures systems of various uh, constitution and the advantage of this uh, comparative public law study and then uh, outcome can be that uh, after uh, this course the student will be understanding different theories will be in a position to compare and evaluate different systems and they can critically analyze and uh, value it in the system in whichever they are doing it and then they can uh, come up with very good papers as part of their dissertation they can choose one of the uh, topic from this so that can be one of the uh, outcome and when we measure this outcomes because nac is emphasizing a lot on measurable outcomes so outcomes are measured primarily by two methods direct method and indirect methods so when we say direct methods so uh, that is classroom uh, continuous assessment mid term end term quizzes assignments projects presentation that can be form of the uh, direct assessment tools and indirect assessment tools can be when a student has undergone this course then we have to take feedback from that student that is called course exit survey so nowadays uh, primary uh, feedback from all course uh, all stakeholders is mandatory so the one of the stakeholder is student then second is faculty then alumni employers so this feedback is taken continuously and their inputs are evaluated and they are discussed in bus and accordingly they are modified so uh, this uh, direct evaluation and indirect evaluation both method, method can be used and weightages can also be accordingly decided normally 80 to 20 weightages is taken so 80% weightage is given to direct uh, method and 20% for indirect method so this way we arrive at our attainment that how much co we have attained in our course after deliver this course and then uh, and normally in ug courses 60% attainment is fixed so if a student is scoring 60% marks one can assume that he has delivered uh, his uh, course material or he has done the job to the satisfaction and in pg it can vary maybe up to 70% or 75% that can be decided by the faculty in consultation with uh, dean and other uh, members so this way uh, obe is now very very essential so whatever course we are teaching we have to keep in mind that this course has to be continuously evaluated on the uh, inputs which one receives so with this now i'll come to this topic when you when uh, any faculty uh, can deliver this but a faculty who has uh, keen interest in the constitution will be beneficial if that faculty takes it up and because this uh, this course needs uh, a deep understanding of indian constitution us constitution then uh, uk system and then some other democracy like switzerland also can be taken into consideration so uh, when you teach this subject to students they are already uh, ug so they know the basics so you may touch upon um, what is law and then different theory of austin kelson uh, uh, and then you can also discuss uh, the hard fuller mor uh, morality and laws uh, uh, discussions so that the student will get some you know uh, understanding of this then you can uh, come to comparative law and uh, if in your class foreign students are more because now uh, in india a lot of uh, foreign students are coming then you can uh, start with uh, maybe magna carta 
and then so that to give a perspective. But if in classroom Indian students are more, you don't have foreign students, then you can start with Indian constitution because that also will give you uh, some uh, understanding. So uh, either way, if you if you are starting from Magna Carta 1215, so uh, you can discuss class 39 and class 40 because they are very important. Rest all is not so, uh, so important. Then you can come to uh, the Bill of Rights of US. So you can tell them that uh, when Constitution of uh, US was uh, adopted, there were no fundamental rights, there were no agreement on uh, fundamental rights. Then later on in, uh, in the form of Bill of Rights in 1791, 10 amendments were brought. So you can discuss them and then you can correlate these with the Indian Constitution. So when you discuss with Indian Constitution, uh, say primarily US and uh, UK Constitution, so you can discuss different theories, that what are the theories we have, uh, so through through case law methods or through theory method or mixed method you can take in classroom. And uh, classroom can be uh, interactive because if you just go and you uh, start discussing the subject, subject the, some of the students may not understand the uh, real, uh, you know, uh, uh, gist of the subject. So I would advise, advise you that whenever you go to class, you uh, five minutes you recap uh, your synopsis, what you are, uh, what you have previously covered, and then five minutes you should. Uh, uh, personally, I am using board, so I use this uh, classic uh, chalk and uh, board method. So nowadays chalk and board, uh, they are not there. Most of the classrooms are now high tech. So they are smart classrooms and you have markers or you have electronic devices. So I'll go to classroom and then I'll write what I'm going to teach in next one hour. So I'll write the bullet points, I write the articles, then I'll write the case laws. So your class knows what they're going to discuss today. So suppose for example, you take separation of powers. So you write on board the theory of separation power and then you write position in India then in US, UK, and then you uh, contrast and evaluate. And when you're discussing this subject in classroom, you can also keep in mind uh, Bloom's taxonomy, because nowadays uh, Bloom's taxonomy is also one of the very uh, important tool to uh, deliver a subject. So Bloom taxonomy, uh, there are six uh, different, different uh, labels of teaching and learning. So the first uh, learning is remember. So when you teach a student, suppose you are teaching a student uh, what is comparative law, or why are we uh, teaching this comparative law? What are the benefits of comparative law uh, study? So you can uh, tell a student in the first class that if they uh, study comparative law, the, uh, then they will be studying different theories, different systems, and different institution of different countries. And then these all will help evolve a system of uh, some particular country. So they will understand and then you can ask in your class test that okay now I'll take a class test uh, tell me what are the uh, advantages of comparative uh, public law study so in this way you are testing the first uh, Bloom's taxonomy which says that whatever you are taught the student should be uh, remembering that concept so that is the uh, basic then uh, when they remember this then you can ask them uh, that uh, how much they have understood so suppose if you if you're teaching them separation of uh, theory of separation of power, you can ask them, okay, why do we separate the power? What is the logic behind separating power? Why don't we uh, 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 follow uh, a system where powers are concentrated, not separated? Or how much separation? How much cooperation? So uh, we, uh, like in India, unlike US constitution, we are not following complete separation of power between executive legislation and judiciary. So you can ask them, that how much you understand. So that is the next step of Bloom taxonomy, that after teaching a particular uh, theory to a student, now you see how much they are understanding and how much they can comprehend that. And the next level is, uh, so uh, the basic is, uh, the first level is uh, remembering, then understanding, and then applying it. So suppose you taught them that in US, uh, there is a president who is heading the executive, and there is a uh, election uh, by electoral college, which elects the president, and then you have judiciary, which is independent uh, so far. And then you can also discuss the appointment method of uh, judges in US and India, and then Congress there, and then uh, parliament in India. So when you discuss all this, then you can ask them third step. So uh, please remember, the first step is uh, remembering a concept. Second step is understanding a concept. And then third is step is that how they apply this concept. So when you, when you tease them that this is the method, how, how uh, this power is uh, separated. And then you can see that uh, unlike US, we are not following this model of complete separation or surgical separation. So we are more close to maybe uh, 
uh, Westminster concept of United Kingdom where uh, if you see uh, judicial review uh, more or less doesn't happen. So parliament is supreme. So in India, uh, because Government of India Act 1935 has huge uh, impact on Indian constitution. So we have not followed uh, what uh, US is following, the uh, surgical separation between executive, judiciary and legislature. So then that is the another step of Bloom taxonomy, that after remembering and understanding how much residents are in a position to apply. So this way you can raise the level and when you set the question paper, there also you can uh, frame the questions uh, in this manner that how much resident have remembered so you can ask direct questions that uh, what is comparative law or what are, what are the advantage of uh, this study of comparative law and then you can go to uh, further you can raise the label that is that is called higher learning or advanced learning so from uh, base learning you can raise the label so uh, remember then uh, understand then apply then evaluate then uh, create so this way, the final stage comes to creation. So in creation, unlike uh, like if some, a student of science can make a robot, if he is studying uh, robotic sciences in law, because society is our lab, so here a student won't be creating some uh, instruments. But here a student, uh, a student can, in the end, write a good Scopus index paper. He can come up with uh, some of the you know uh, book. So that way he is creating his knowledge and disseminating the knowledge. So in uh, comparative law, uh, How are you going, sir? Fine. So, So this way, please remember the outcome-based education system and then try to correlate with this uh, outcome-based education system with Bloom taxonomy so that uh, those who are in, uh, who are higher uh, uh, learner in the classroom, they get to do something higher and those who are, uh, you know, pace learner, for them you can have, you know, lower uh, models of Bloom taxonomy. So you can see uh, the Bloom taxonomy on Google. This way your course will be uh, quite uh, interesting for uh, both the uh, categories of student. And then when you discuss, uh, say for example, separation of power. So as I was mentioning, you write on board that uh, how Indian system, how Indian constitution is providing for separation of power and what is the need of separation of power and then how US uh, constitution is applying, uh, providing for separation of power and how UK system is providing for separation of power. So if we talk of India, then you can make this uh, uh, course very uh, interesting and two way because in my class I make the classroom uh, quite interactive because if you just go to classroom and you know you uh, tell them uh, your uh, knowledge, it doesn't uh, carry much. So when you go to classroom, uh, the very, uh, you know, the, these, these are PG students. So you can have some uh, friendly environment in the classroom and you can ask students, okay, how much you understand? That how you understand the, because in UG they have already read and some of them must be knowing uh, advanced uh, concepts also. So you can make classroom very interactive. So write on board and maybe uh, uh, 15 minutes you teach, Five minutes you uh, make some interaction, ask some question answers. So that way class will become very animated. Otherwise one way classroom uh, doesn't uh, you know uh, impact much. So you write on board that uh, in India, how Indian constitution is providing for legislature, executive and judiciary and article 74 provides for that there shall be council of uh, minister. And uh, article 74 this also provides for that there shall be president who, who shall be bound by the aid and advice of the council of ministers. So you tell them that what is the, you know, uh, uh, what is the theory behind this? Why they have made uh, the president of India bound by the aid and advice of the council of ministers, unlike US president, who is not uh, bound by the aid and advice of the council of ministers. But then you can tell them that we have uh, in a way followed the UK system where uh, the king or queen, uh, they are held above, uh, you know, all this uh, government uh, things. But then uh, our president is not titular head also. So somebody can ask you that does uh, Indian president uh, uh, have no powers? Then you can tell them it's not the case. 
then you can give them some live examples like Gani Jal Singh blocked in postal amendment bill. So you can tell them that uh, though uh, constitution doesn't provide uh, for veto power, but there are ways because under article uh, 111 uh, which provides for, uh, you know, assent to bill by president, uh, president uh, can uh, assent the bill can send the bill back for reconsideration and if a bill is sent back to him after reconsideration then he has no other way other than to assent but constitution is not providing any time frame so president can always uh, keep a bill uh, with him for long period and if it is presented in uh, lower house that is lok sabha it get dissolved with the dissolution of lok sabha 